Hello everyone and welcome to today's program, Bioinformatics, Understanding Our Genes. My name is Alex and I'm a program manager here at C2ST and we're very glad that you're joining us to hear today's talk. Bioinformatics is a really unique emerging topic um, and we have a really exciting speaker, Dr. Sarab Sinha, who is here to talk to you today about his work. First, we'd like to thank our partners. Um, we have the Carl R. Woes Institute for Genomic Biology, which is where science meet society. It's an interdisciplinary institute dedicated to transformative research and technology in the life sciences using team-based strategies to tackle grand societal challenges. We also have the Catherine and Don Kleinmitt Center for Business for Genomics in Business and Society, which provides unique opportunities for economic development, public engagement, and social impact through genomics and business. Finally, we have Chi-Town Bio, who are dedicated to putting the knowledge, skills, and tools of biotechnology into the hands of all Chicagoans who want to explore the living world and use it to benefit our communities. And if you're new to C2ST, we're a 14-year-old not-for-profit organization who's dedica dedicated to putting on free or low-cost science programming to make sure that science is indeed for everyone. Uh, if you like us and support our mission, feel free to donate on our website. Visit c2st.org to do so and you can also sign up for our newsletter there. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sarab Sinha, who's the founder, professor, and Willett faculty scholar in the Department of Computer Science at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and he's the director of computational genomics in the Carl R. Woes Institute for Genomic Biology. His research is in the area of bioinformatics with a focus on regulatory genomics and systems biology. If you have questions for Dr. Sinha during today's program, please visit c2st2.cnf.io, or you can put them in the chats and our staff will monitor them and make sure that they get into our Q&A app. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Dr. Sinha for joining us. We're really excited to hear more about your work in bioinformatics and, and learn exactly what it is that bioinformatics really means. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I'm honored to be invited uh, uh, to this forum, and it's my great pleasure to be able to talk to all of uh, the audience uh, today about an exciting branch of science that you may or may not have heard of. It's called bioinformatics. Um, this is a broad field of research and development that applies state-of-the-art techniques in computing and data science to the field of biology. Um, but I will keep this presentation more focused than that and talk about a sub-discipline of bioinformatics that seeks to explain the phenomenon of gene regulation. And in doing so, hopes to empower us to understand how our genes encode the incredible diversity of life forms that we see around us. Well, I'm sorry I already used some jargon, which I've been advised not to. So I need to explain what is gene regulation. Um, okay. Um, and why there is an entire community of scientists and bioinformaticians obsessed with understanding it. But first things first, our story has to begin with DNA, which I'm sure everyone here has heard about. Um, to a computer scientist like me, um, uh, DNA is nothing but a very long text um, written in a four letter alphabet, A, C, G, and T, that we need to decipher the meaning of. Um, and a gene, is just a piece of this long text um, that has the code or recipe for the cell to make a protein. Mind you, there are thousands of genes, each carrying the recipe of a different protein to be made if and when it's needed by the cell. It turns out that for this recipe to be used by the cell, it first needs to be copied um, or transcribed into an intermediate form called an mRNA which is then ready to be read by the, uh, the, uh, by the cell's chefs, so to speak, in cooking up the proteins, uh, just the right proteins that the cell needs. Let me change to the laser pointer. Um, why proteins? Because proteins do all the chemistry in the cell, all its important functions that we need uh, for life. This entire process of a gene being transcribed and the copy being used uh, to make a protein is called gene expression. And that's the second piece of jargon for today, and I'll be use, using it frequently. Now, the crucial thing to know about gene expression is that it can be regulated by the cell, and that is, can be turned on or off, and more generally, to be made more rapid or slower. And that's gene regulation. 
sorry. That's mm -hmm. gene regulation. Um, and to put it briefly, gene regulation is the process of turning genes on or off as and when a cell needs the protein corresponding to the genes. This is illustrated in this oversimplified cartoon here. Let this green pipe here, this green pipe, be a, um, a, a, be a gene and that needs to be copied. Um, and it's part of the DNA. And let this purple um, circle be the cell's machinery for copying the gene to be used as part of, the, of that gene's expression process. Um, what you see here are two cells, one on the left, one on the right, with the same gene. The gene is the same. All cells have the same genes. But with the copying machinery being much more conscientious on the, in the cell on the right, while wasting a lot of time between successive copying acts in the cell on the left. As a result, you can see that the cell on the left has far fewer copies of the mRNA being made uh, and therefore has low gene expression, while the cell on the right has high gene expression for the same gene. Now, a final piece of biology important for this talk. Here's that cell with the truant copying machinery that is more into having fun than doing its job. But, if, um, but then if the cell has a specific molecule called a transcription factor or TF, the TF can come and bind the DNA near the gene and then drag the copying machinery over to do its copying job. The TF likes to bind a very specific pattern in the DNA, for example, a pattern like TCTAATTG, and will bind only if the gene has its pattern nearby. TFs are actually a, an entire family of molecules and come in different shapes or flavors, 2,000 different ones, in fact, with each TF having its own preferred pattern for binding DNA. We're now ready for a quick recap of the uh, jargon that we've learned so far that we'll keep coming back to in the rest of the talk. So we have a gene being a piece of DNA that has the recipe to make a protein. Humans have 20,000 genes. Gene expression is the process of copying the recipe written in the gene and making a protein using it. Gene regulation is turning gene, the, the gene expression on or off, high or low. And it leads to many or few protein molecules being made from the gene's recipe in the cell. And finally, transcription factor, or TF, is a molecule that binds specific patterns in DNA and then recruits the copying machinery to copy the gene's recipe, leading to high gene expression. Now. Refining our picture just a little bit, we see that different cells may differ in the TFs that they have. For instance, the cell on the right has uh, several molecules of TF1, which promotes copying of the gene, and thus the cell has high gene expression. You can see a lot of the mRNA copies being made out of this gene compared to the cell here. Interestingly, there are also TFs that inhibit or suppress gene expression. Um, and the cell on the left has one such TF in several, in several molecules of it. This one is called TF2, for lack of a better name. And um, what it does is that it lowers the, the, the act of uh, the rate of copying, leading to even fewer um, mRNA copies being made than this cell in the middle, which was kind of the default. Um, these three cells thus have the same uh, DNA, this pipe here in green, um, the same gene, but the gene is expressed at low, medium, or high levels in these different cells. And this is what makes different types of cells. For instance, the cell in the middle might be your skin cell, and this one on the right, your heart cell, and the one on the left, your liver cell. Indeed, gene regulation is responsible for making the large variety of cell types that any living being has as an adult or during its development. Gene regulation makes our bodies. 
I said earlier that all cells of an individual have the same DNA. So this is a normal liver cell, say. Um, however, sometimes uh, the DNA itself can be slightly different between different cells. This is the normal cell where the TF is binding to its binding site and recruiting the copying machinery and gene expression is high. Now, let's imagine that another liver cell um, happens to get a mutation in that binding site so that the AA in the middle now has changed to a GG. The TF1 will no longer be able to bind the, here because its preferred site is not present. And as a result, the gene expression will now go down. And um, this, for all you know, might be a tumorous liver cell. So um, it is possible that uh, different cells of the same type have slightly different DNA, and that can lead to um, uh, gene expression changing, and as a result, disease uh, coming along. So in fact, it's well known that um, a lot of the undesired things that happen in cancer cells have to do with the disruption of the cell's gene regulation machinery. And in fact, tons of evidence available today suggest that DNA mutations that make some of us predisposed to various hereditary diseases are also likely related to disruptions of gene regulation. Bottom line, gene regulation is a super important part of bio the biology of our cells. Now, bioinformaticians have a lot to offer to this important area. And the reason for this is that the is, the, is the spectacular ongoing genomics data revolution, which I will touch upon next. Some of you might have heard of the phrase big data, which refers to the pervasive influence that data, lots and lots of it, has on the modern world. We recently conducted a survey that found that genomics is on course to rival astronomy as the largest generator of data by 2025. And the reason for this is that sequencing DNA has become orders of magnitude cheaper in a very short time. Now, DNA sequencing basically refers to a machine reading and reporting the full text of an individual's DNA. Sequencing being cheap, as cheap as it is now, um, and given the potential for a person's DNA being a game changer in a patient's diagnosis and treatment, some clinics are routinely sequencing their pa patient's DNA already. But it doesn't end there. The same inexpensive technology that reads a person's DNA is being used to profile all sorts of useful information in any given um, biological specimen or sample. One such application is to measure the gene expression of every gene in one go. The same technology has been adapted to profile the entire DNA for all the places where a particular TF binds as part of its job in regulating gene expression. As you can imagine, these different versions of sequencing technology, collectively called multi-omics technologies, play a major role in helping us figuring out gene regulation. And indeed, large national and international consortia have been funded to generate tons of data using these technologies and sharing them in the public domain for everyone to use and analyze. With such a flood of genomics and multiomics data rushing onwards, it becomes close to impossible to figure out what it all means by eyeballing the data. That's where bioinformatics comes in. And in the rest of the talk, I'll show you a few examples, a few simple examples of how bioinformatics helps us make sense of the large volumes of biological data obtained through modern sequencing technology. One such important example is in analyzing how gene expression changes during a biological process or from one biological sample to another. So let's start with a toy data set that is representative of what a typical data set might look like. In this data set, we have information on six different biological samples or specimens. Think of blood samples from different individuals, um, three of them being from cancer patients and three being from healthy individuals. The biological samples or specimens are represented by columns of this data spreadsheet. The rows represent genes 
all 20 some thousand of them. And the numbers here represent the expression level of each gene in each biological specimen. The numbers are fake, so don't worry about them, except to note that each gene is low in some samples, the red shades, and um, high uh, or highly expressed in other samples, the blue shades. Now, occasionally, we find a gene such as this gene G2 that is low in all the three healthy individuals or samples and high in all the three cancer patients. Such a gene is called a differentially expressed gene as it is expressed at different levels between the two groups that we are interested in contrasting. Often people use bioinformatics programs to fish out such differentially expressed uh, genes systematically and comprehensively from among the tens of thousands of genes present in the spreadsheet. Now we will see a real gene expression spreadsheet with data from many breast cancer tumor samples. So each column is a tumor sample. Here, high expression values are shown in red um, and low expression values are in green. But wait, this spreadsheet appears to be far from random looking. For instance, adjacent columns, look at the columns here, um, they seem to be similar and those here seem to be similar to each other. This is because a computer algorithm, a computer program arranged the columns automatically so as to place similar columns or similar samples next to each other. Similarly, the rows, the rows which represent genes have been reordered as well to place similar rows right below each other. The specialized computer programs that do such reordering automatically so as to group together similar columns and similar rows in the spreadsheet are called clustering algorithms. Now let's zoom into a small group or of rows or genes. This small group here is now zoomed in here. Um, of the, and um, let's see what, what, what we find. It looks like most of these genes have similar expression profiles along the different samples. That is um, low expression in these samples and high expression in these samples. Applying our clustering algorithms thus reveals such sets of coordinately expressed genes. As I mentioned earlier, the clustering algorithms also rearrange the columns, the biological samples or patients into two broad groups it looks like, one group uh, about that ends uh, about here in the middle um, and the other group on the right of that middle line, right? So um, these two groups, it turns out, are two different subtypes of breast cancer patients with different prognoses and different and even different responses to the same drugs. Thus, clustering can identify um, subtypes of patients that may require different treatments. Here, I show you a different kind of pattern that bioinformatics programs can find from gene expression data. These data correspond to measurements of gene expression in some cells upon being treated with a particular cancer drug. Each panel here focuses on a group of genes identified by the clustering algorithms to have similar changes in expression upon drug treatment. Let's look at one such group of genes more closely. This plot shows uh, on the x-axis the time after the drug treatment, and on the y-axis it shows the gene expression on some scale. There's a whole bunch of red lines, each of which represents how a single gene changes expression from the earlier time points to the later time points after uh, the drug treatment. You can see that all the red lines have the same general pattern of going up in expression in the first five or six hours and then staying steady or perhaps decreasing slightly. Now going back to these panels, each group it shows a group of, each panel here shows a group of genes with a distinct temporal pattern worthy of further experimental follow-up. 
For us, the important message is that such groups of genes and thus their associated distinct patterns can be identified using the clustering algorithms. And if you're curious how these algorithms or computer programs for clustering work, this highly simplified cartoon tries to give you a glimpse of the basic idea. Suppose that each gene's expression was measured not in hundreds of samples, but in just two samples, um, uh, which we will call the experiment one and the experiment two. So each point here is a gene and it's, we are recording its measured expression in those two experiments. So we can plot each gene as a point on the graph paper with the X coordinate and the Y coordinate representing the expression levels in these two experiments. And then all we need is a computer program to identify these clusters of points located near each other in this 2D space or 2D plane. This is not trivial, but at least far less mysterious than what it might have been or seemed initially. The clustering algorithms basically implement this simple idea more thoroughly. Okay, so now that we know how bioinformatics algorithms can start detecting patterns in the gene expression data, uh, such as sets of coordinately expressed genes, we'll see what the next steps might be. Recall that the gene expression data spreadsheet from the breast cancer samples, how we use clustering to identify a set of genes here that um, uh, have low expression in patients of one subtype and high expression in patients of the other subtype? Well, having found such a set of genes, the natural questions to arise are, what are these genes? What do they do? And why are they differentially expressed between the two sub subtypes of breast cancer patients? What can they tell us about the diversity of cancer and better still about different treatment outcomes? Well, the answer to the first question, what are these genes, is easily obtained because the spreadsheet has the names of the, of, 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 the, of the genes and for each row already recorded there. Um, some of the important genes in this group are listed here and they don't make sense to most of you probably and they don't make sense to me certainly. Um, and so all we have is just a laundry list of genes that have something to do with the subtypes of cancer, but I don't know what. So the next step where bioinformatics comes in is in analyzing such a gene set for useful insights. The idea is illustrated in this Venn diagram where the rectangle represents all 20,000 genes in the spreadsheet and the red circle represents the smaller set of genes that were in that differentially expressed set we just saw. Now suppose that we have knowledge of all the genes known to be involved in some cellular function, say F. And this set is represented by this gray circle. Then some of the genes in the differentially expressed set will also be associated with the function F. That's this intersection or overlap between these two sets. We can then ask whether the observed overlap is surprisingly large given the sizes of the two sets and the totality of all the genes. For example, the gene set that we identified from the breast cancer data had 15 genes, these 15 genes, that's the red circle. And five of these 15 genes were also known um, to be involved in the function positive regulation of cell growth. Our bioinformatics algorithms can then do the statistics and tell, the, tell us that this proportion, 5 out of 15, being involved in cell growth is way above chance expectation and is likely pointing to something interesting. You can, in fact, do such bioinformatics analyses with uh, every possible um, known function, not just this particular one, um, through a, an online resource called David, for example. And then biologists can take it from there, having just learned that the genes differentially expressed between the two subtypes of breast cancer have something to do with, cell, with the control of cell growth, which is a valuable high level insight, or as we, will, we like to call it, a systems level insight. We will now move on to bioinformatics methods for building gene regulatory networks. I'll explain what that is. And this pertains 
to the other major question that we asked earlier about the differentially expressed gene set. Not only do we want to know what are these genes and what do they do, but why are they differently expressed between the two subtypes of patients? And a key word for our answer here is the word coordinately. Recall that we had found this set of genes to be a set of coordinately expressed genes, low in the same samples, high in the same samples. These genes are somehow being coordinated to behave the same way as we go from one sample to another, from one subtype to another. It turns out that such coordination is achieved by a class of molecules we saw earlier as being central to our story, the transcription factors or TFs. This cartoon of two cells shown here is basically the same as what we had seen earlier uh, with the cell on the right having uh, molecules of TF1 that can activate this gene and lead to high gene expression. And the cell on the left is lacking the TF1 molecule and has low gene expression. And um, in this case, the cell on the right may have come from patient subtype 2 while the cell on the left came from subtype 1. And it is the TF's presence in the cells of subtype 2 that led to the high expression of this gene, let's say G1 in subtype 2. We represent this observation, this regulatory relationship between the presence of TF1 and the activation of gene G1 in this way pictorially, with two nodes or circles representing TF1 and G1, and an arrow from TF1 to G1 representing that TF1 regulates G1. In fact, if you recall, TF1 can have its binding site near other genes as well. And if so, it can regulate those other genes in the same way. And we can have more arrows or edges from TF1 to each of those other genes, each arrow representing the fact that TF1 can control or activate uh, a gene. Similarly, a different TF, say TF2, may regulate several other genes, and these regulatory influences can be also depicted by arrows coming from TF2 to each of those other genes. It is even possible for some genes to be simultaneously under the control of more than one TF, and thus have arrows coming in from both TFs in this, of this example. This sort of diagram, which depicts which TFs regulate which genes, is called a gene regulatory network. Such networks are a popular and useful way to describe the intricate web of regulatory relationships that make the magic of life, of life happen one cell at a time. For example, this is the gene regulatory network responsible for building the body of a sea urchin embryo. It looks lo a lot like a circuit board, doesn't it? This is one of the best characterized gene regulatory networks out there, and its circuit-like form has been an inspiration for many computer scientists to take up biology as a subject of interest. The network I sh just showed you, this one, was made through many, many person years of painstaking experimental work. And now I want to describe uh, uh, how such networks may also be built by bioinformatics programs. Let's in fact see first how we might discover just one edge in the regulatory network, the edge from TF1 to gene G1. Recall that our discovery started with the observation of a set of coordinately expressed genes and with the search for the coordinator. Let's say gene G1 was one of these rows then, this particular row here. Then the algorithm just has to find another row in there that is similar to the row for G1. Because if T1 regulates G1, then it is likely that G1 will turn on or off in a manner that follows TF1. Such a relationship can be easily detected by a computer program by systematically comparing the row of every transcription factor, every TF, to the row of every gene. To check whether the gene follows the TS expression pattern, the program performs what is called a correlation analysis, where the TF and the gene expression level in each biological sample is plotted as a point on a graph paper, and the program searches 
for this sort of a linear relationship, a straight line relationship um, in our trend in the plot. While it is relatively easy for programs to detect um, the straight TF to gene edges like this, it gets trickier to find out when a gene is under the joint control of two or more TFs. So for, in for instance, if G4 is regulated by the combined action of TF1 and TF2, the data may not reveal the simple correlation we saw in the previous, sli in the, in the previous slide. But don't worry, bioinformaticians have quite a few aces up their sleeve for this tricky situation. One common way to discover such relationships is to use what's called a linear model, where the program imagines that the gene G4 has an expression equal to a weighted sum of the expression levels of the two TFs, some weight W1 times the expression of TF1 plus weight W2 times the expression of TF2 is what the expression of G4 is. Um, and then it tries to fiddle with these weights W1 and W2 until its assumption is borne out by the data. If it fails to make this happen, then TF1 and TF2 do not seem to jointly regulate G4, and it moves on to trying other TFs as regulators of G4. But if it, it, the data do bear out this sort of a relationship, then the program has just inferred two edges in the gene regulatory network. Another bioinformatics approach take, uh, that takes the circuit uh, or circuit board analogy quite literally uh, imagines that each gene um, and each TF is in an on or off state in, in any given sample, and that the gene G4 is going to be on when both TF1 and TF2 are on, and it's going to be off otherwise. The program then tries to find whether this, this or some other logical combination of TF1 and TF2 can explain the on and off patterns of gene G4. And uh, if, once it finds it, then it can infer edges of the gene regulatory network. And in fact, folks have come up with even more sophisticated and complex ways to explain a gene's expression as being related to two or more TFs, methods that belong to the broad field of research that's called machine learning. And by the way, I'd like to add that these bioinformatics methods or algorithms actually do work. For example, this is a gene regulatory network that was reconstructed automatically through machine learning approaches in my lab and explains the earliest stages of development in a fruit fly embryo. We're nearing the end of our time, um, and I hope I was able to convey some of the super cool things that bioinformatics programs can and have been doing to push the frontiers of biology. I want to end with a trailer of the most exciting new blockbuster out there in genomics. It's called single cell technology. The basic idea is simple. As, we, as I mentioned earlier, sequencing can be used to take a biological sample made up of a number of different cells and give us a measure of the total amount of gene expression for each gene in that cell, in that sample. That's shown here on the left. The single cell technology can actually measure the gene expression in each cell of the sample separately and can report the gene expression levels for the gene in each cell type present in the sample. Um, now, it may not sound like much, but it's a total game changer. And the reason is that most biological spe specimens that we are interested in understanding, be it a sample of blood, a biopsy of lung cancer, or a slice of, the human, of, a, of a mouse brain, there are, there are many different cell types present in it, and single cell technology gives us the full picture of gene expression in those cell types. This new technology has completely recharged the bioinformatics community today, and a number of different computational challenges have emerged as a result, some of them entirely new, and some, like the gene regulatory network inference problem, being recast in a new mold. So the exciting journey of bioinformatics continues nearly 30 years after the first international conference of this community, thanks to biotechnology constantly inventing ever more impressive ways to profile what's going on in our cells. And that's all I have for today. Thanks very much. And I'm, uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Sarab. I think that was a really uh, 
you know, you'd really distilled all the topics down for us, which I appreciate and gave us a really good background into both biology, gene regulation, gene expression, uh, all of those topics. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so our first question is, um, what do you think the most surprising finding in bioinformatics has been or some of the, so the single well and single cell sounds like a game changer. Are there any other surprising game changers? That's a difficult question. I wasn't prepared for the most surprising finding in bioinformatics. I think um, the um, if if I had to answer it, I'll say that uh, we've been shocked um, by how complex um, biology is, and uh, no matter how much more data um, our collaborators are able to generate. Um, the uh, algorithms always need to be um, advanced more and more to deal with it and, and reveal uh, useful biological insights. So in that sense, it's, uh, uh, it's the, 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 the surprise has been in the enormity of the challenge itself. Um, having said that, um, I think uh, bioinformatics has um, um, been incredibly successful in um, mapping um, the genome as it's playing out in a variety of different cell types. Uh, very large um, consortia have led to these kinds of maps that um, um, have then been incredibly useful to biologists uh, in planning their follow-up experiments. So it's not really one finding uh, in, that I would like to report from biology, but uh, just the um, the the biggest achievements um, and um, of bioinformatics and the ch and the and the challenge um, that keeps us awake um, going forward. So it's almost like you know making one discovery just sparks more and more questions and it never really ends. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's exciting. There's always new stuff to work on then. Um, so you answered this a little bit, and someone wants to know um, where you see your field going in the future. So maybe maybe expanding on some of the applications of the single cell um, discoveries that you mentioned. Right. So um, that's one area. Um, in, in, so and, and that's a technology driven area. And you know, usually technology comes up with something totally new every five or 10 years. So uh, if you're thinking very long term, um, um, I think one of the biggest challenges going forward will be to map interactions among uh, interactions among entities, for lack of a better word, at all sorts of levels. So there are interactions among genes, some of which I talked about, the regulatory network, but there are interactions among other types of molecules in the cells. There are interactions among different cells. There are interactions um, uh, among uh, different groups of cells and, and so on and so forth at higher and higher levels of biological organization. And we, ha we haven't really made any dent on, the, on this, in this enormous challenge of uh, understanding interactions and how they play out uh, at these different levels, how they feed into uh, uh, from one level to the other and feed back um, to make uh, life and ecology happen. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so a lot more to discover in the future, which is again, exciting. Um, so someone from Facebook is asking how bioinformatics might apply to plant breeding. Um, great question. Uh, I am not, uh, I, I don't have experience in plant breeding, but uh, my, um, uh, my friends and colleagues in the crop sciences departments, um, they certainly try to uh, reconstruct gene regulatory networks that try to describe uh, why uh, pl uh, different individuals of the same plant species may be uh, differing in their uh, phenotypes, or especially phenotypes that uh, we care about, and um, how that those differences are encoded in the genotype or DNA, so that they can, um, you know, uh, have, get a better handle on the genotype to phenotype question. Um, that can then help help them with uh, a more targeted breeding. 
Okay, so like a lot of agriculture, right? It's it's identifying the genes and the pieces of information that are going to give us the crops that are most beneficial to what whatever it is that humans are looking for at that time. R right, and and I th I think the the questions of gene regulation remain as perhaps more unsolved in um, in in uh, plant studies. Okay, so that's an area of a future study that more people will be moving into, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have um, maybe time for one more question, maybe two more questions. Um, can you give an overview of some of the specific work that your lab is trying to tackle right now? Sure. Um, so uh, one of the directions uh, we have been working on is to un uh, partner with uh, cancer biologists to understand uh, how gene regulation underlies um, cancer progression. So we recently published a paper in genome biology on um, the regulatory network uh, underlying uh, colorectal cancer progression. Um, we've also been interested in understanding why different uh, individuals respond differently to the same cancer drugs. Um, we've published uh, a paper in the recent past on um, on pharmacogenomics, which is uh, the understanding of uh, uh, analysis of genomics data in the context of uh, drug response variation. So um, that's one major direction. Um, also, I've been partnering with my uh, colleagues at um, uh, the IGB to study uh, uh, what can be broadly called neurogenomics, where we try to understand uh, how social experiences in animals, in social animals, change the brain um, at an epigenetic level. So, um, and, and so, and um, again, there's are questions related to gene regulation that are pervasive in that field of research. And uh, we are figuring out uh, the gene regulatory networks for changing brain gene expression um, uh, uh, after social uh, experiences. Um, and that's another very exciting area, uh, area of uh, research for us going forward. Yeah, epigenetics and the way that that affects our gene expression sounds like a really fascinating. Yeah, I would have loved to one. talk more about epigenetics, but you know, you and I discussed that we just won't have the time uh, to delve into that. So uh, maybe for another day and another speaker. Yeah, perhaps we could uh, we could do a follow up to this and talk a little bit more about epigenetics sometime soon. Um, but I think in terms of trying to keep us on schedule for today. I think that's all the time we have. Um, so Dr. Sina Sinha, thank you so much for joining us today. We really thank appreciate you your expertise. I think, again, you did such a fantastic job of distilling such a complex topic into a really, really easy to digest format in a way that, that makes sense to everybody, which is amazing. So thank you for the time in doing thanks that. Thanks a lot, Alex. And thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and logging into today's program. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you enjoyed our program and would like to evaluate it for us, um, just helps us continue to improve and put on programs that you want to see in the future. Please visit c2st2.cnf.io in order to do that for us. Uh, if you'd like to donate to support our mission of making science for everyone, please visit c2st.org and click Give Now. You can also sign up for our newsletter there to learn about the upcoming programs we have. Thank you to everybody and good night. We'll see you soon.